Have you always wanted to make a game for your favorite old computer or console, but you thought it was too difficult? Think again! Today we're going to cheat and learn how to use modern technology to make games for retro platforms much easier than it used to be. So let me get this out of the way right now. This is not a crash course or an assembly language, and I'm also not going to tell you how to draw lines on the screen or how to make super optimized sprite drawing routines. This is going to be about how to make a retro game taking advantage of modern technologies to make it as easy and efficient as possible. Now, I'll be the first one to admit that I have limited experience making retro games. There are some people out there that have much more experience than me. I wrote an Amstrad CPC diagnostics ROM, and I've been writing prototypes for an Amstrad game for the last couple of months, but most importantly, I have over 25 years of professional gaming development experience, so I'm going to be leaning on that mostly. The first thing I recommend before you start making a game is that you try to sort out what your goals really are. Making a retro game is a really broad goal that isn't going to be very helpful. If you can dig down, you can probably get more details. Do you just want to get something moving on the screen on your favorite childhood computer? If so, maybe writing a basic program is all you need. As a matter of fact, if you've never done that before, that might be a great way to start and then come back here. I'm thinking the majority of you watching at this point are really ready to start pushing the machine and attempt to write something in assembly language. Maybe this is your first time, or maybe you've done that before. I'm hoping you learn new things either way. Another thing that will help you narrow down the kind of game you want to make is in terms of what you're trying to accomplish. Are you experimenting with assembly techniques in this machine? If so, just try something really simple first, maybe some kind of Pac-Man or single screen shooter. That way you can focus on the technical aspects of it. If you have some experience already, then you may be ready to start pushing the boundaries of what the machine can do. Maybe you want to create a game in a genre that didn't exist 30 years ago, like for example an Infinite Runner. Or maybe you want to remake a game that had a shameful port back in the day and you think you can do better. Or maybe you want to experiment with some new techniques never seen before. Wait a second, how can we be talking about new techniques when we're dealing with retro hardware? You would think that because the hardware came out in the mid-80s that everything has been fully explored and there's nothing new to see. Well, you'd be wrong. Back then, we didn't have the internet. We didn't have the collective of thousands of hundreds of thousands of people pushing the boundaries of the hardware collectively, figuring out how to make incredible things. Instead, we had programmers, which were often just teenagers working out of their bedrooms, working individually with limited documentation, just trying to get something to work. Yes, new tricks and techniques were discovered through the lifetime of the machine, but there were lots of things left undiscovered before developers moved on to other platforms. One of the big draws for me and other people working on retro platforms is experimenting with things that were not common knowledge back in the commercial lifetime of the machine. When you see some of the games made today, they often feel like it's a whole different platform when you compare them to commercial years of 30 years ago. It's night and day. I mean, just look at this. You're probably already familiar with some of the ZX Spectrum classic games like Manic Miner, Jetpack, or even Rainbow Islands to include a more advanced 128K game. Now look at some of the modern games released on the ZX Spectrum in the last few years. Old Tower. That doesn't even look like a Spectrum game with vertical scroll and the way it seems to break all color limitations. Same thing with Ringo. What sorcery is that? That is nothing like a ZX Spectrum game I have ever seen. And amazingly, the full source code for those games is available out there, so you have no excuse not to do something like that if you wanted to. So tip number one is Take advantage of that knowledge and dig up all you can find on forums specific to the platform you're targeting. You'll probably find people dissecting techniques from classic games, as well as discussing brand new techniques or ones that were at some point reserved just for demos. For example, for my prototype, I've been learning about hardware scrolling on the Amstrad CPC, which is something that a lot of people claimed the machine couldn't do. But it can. It may not have been intended for it when it was designed, but people with very intimate knowledge of the machine managed to make it happen over the years. So I've been catching up and playing with different implementations of hardware scrolling. To give you an idea of the kind of in-depth documentation there is out there today, here's a document that was written a few years ago about the CRT controller of the Amstrad CPC and the BBC Micro, incidentally. Yes, that is a 171-page document about one chip. 
documenting all sorts of unintended timings, side effects, and variations on the chip. I find that kind of thing fascinating, and even though I probably only fully, truly understand about half of it, I love to dig into it and learn new things every time I grab it. And speaking of platforms, the other thing you need to decide before we move forward is what platform you're going to be targeting. Maybe that sounds pretty straightforward, but it isn't. For a lot of you, the answer probably is pretty automatic. I want to make a game for Platform X because it's the one that I love the most. And that's totally fair. But within that platform, you still need to decide what to target. Are you going to need a memory expansion or the base system? Is it going to be a disk, cartridge, or tape? Is it going to require any modern accessories? All those are very valid questions and will hugely affect the game you end up making. Some people are attracted to the challenge of making a game to fit in the lowest level platform, something closer to what it was like in the 80s. For a ZX Spectrum, for example, that might mean just using 16 kilobytes of RAM, which sure, it's quite a challenge, but the results are going to be very different than if you're targeting a ZX Spectrum Plus 3 with 128 kilobyte of RAM and an AY chip and a disk drive. And that's not even getting into modern upgrades. If you require something like a detonator or some kind of ROM cartridge, now you have almost unlimited ROM space for your game. Or if you choose to require an ULA Plus, you suddenly have access to many more colors than the original ZX Spectrum. Talk about having lots of choices. But wait, there are more potential choices. It may sound kind of intuitive, but you may want to make a retro game with air quotes for a modern computer. It's definitely not going to be the same than wrestling with constant memory and CPU limitations, but it may still scratch that itch and be much easier to make. A good example of that is one of my favorite games, VVVVV, <laughs> which looks like something that came out of a Commodore 64, but it runs on modern computers, and it does a lot more than a Commodore 64 would. You could even go as far as to target an emulated platform which maybe never even existed. I'm thinking mostly of the Pico 8, which is a full program that emulates a fantasy 8-bit console that never existed in hardware. That has certainly some charm to it. Finally, another potential platform choice is a modern retro computer. And by that I mean it's an 8- or 16-bit computer that was released recently. It can be something like the Commander X16, or even something like the outstanding Aegon computer from the Byte Attic, which I'm planning on making a whole video about this in the future. The interesting thing about these platforms is that they'll usually be quite powerful by 80s standards, and at the same time, they haven't been explored very much, so you may be breaking new ground with them. All right, time to start programming. Should we turn on the machine and start working on it? Well, that's one way to do it. And some people decide to set a constraint for themselves that the whole game needs to be developed exclusively in the target machine. That will certainly give you a new appreciation for the machine itself. You may think that's very authentic and the true way that games were made in the 80s, but I'm going to let you in on a secret. Only amateurs did that because of how extremely limiting it was and it is. Developing on the same machine itself, not only are you limited to the software in this machine, but you usually can not fit both the game and the assembler or disassembler in memory at once. In a single mistake in your code, and you need to restart the computer and reload everything again. I know, I'm speaking from experience. When I learned to program on the Amstrad CPC, I quickly moved from basic to assembly, but doing everything on the Amstrad was absolutely painful. Interesting and unique, but painful. Sure, you can make that better by adding ROMs with the development tools, which makes them load faster and makes more memory available, but it's still far, far from ideal. And the fact is that most professional companies used a different computer to develop for their target machines, usually something faster, larger, and more expensive. I know some companies used some mainframe-like computers to develop for a wide variety of different platforms. Others used more powerful computers like a Commodore Amiga, while others even used PCs. Even back when I got my first game development job in 1998, we were making PC games, and we used one PC for development and another one as the target computer for testing, like you can see right here. That's the one sitting on the right. So yes, let's take full advantage of modern technology and use modern computers to create our retro games. But before we go into my favorite setup for developing retro games, let's talk about what an absolutely ideal setup would be. Then we can work our way backwards and try to get the closest thing to that possible. In the ideal world, I'd like to do all the programming on a modern computer, 
Taking full advantage of nice editors, autocomplete, split views, and quick access to the internet, then I would want to press a button and instantly, and that part is key, have the game run on the target platform. And then to make things even better, I want to be able to debug it by breaking into it, examining memory contents, CPU registers, stepping on the statements one at a time, and all of that good stuff. Does it seem like a fantasy? I admit it's a bit of a stretch, but not too far from reality. We can come really, really close to that. To start with, for editing, you can use your favorite editor or development environment on your platform of choice. I'm using Sublime with a plugin for Z80 syntax highlighting, but you can use whatever you like best, Visual Studio, BB Edit, or whatever. This is definitely something that other computers do way better than older computers. You can have higher resolution, you can easily copy and paste text, what a concept. You can work with many files at once, do find and replace, and really all the things that we take for granted today. Next, let's look how to build the code. I'm assuming most people are going to write the game in assembly. I know some people choose C for that, but I'm trying to get as much control over memory as possible, so assembly is a much better choice for that. You need to find an assembler on your development machine that will generate code for the CPU you are using. In my case, since I was targeting the Amstrad CPC, I ended up using the Z80 assembler SJASM+. There are lots and lots of different assemblers, so pick one that you like or has features that you need, or simply a popular one so you have lots of documentation and help nearby. For assembling the code, I started looking into make files or some other kind of dependency system until I realized there's absolutely no point in adding that complexity for a build system when something builds so quickly that it's almost instant. So my recommendation is to simply assemble all the files every single time. Building all of that is probably gonna be a tenth of a second, so who cares? You have to love modern technology sometimes, even in a retro channel. The next part of our ideal setup is to instantly run the program that we created with the assembler on the target machine. Launching the game directly in the target machine would be ideal, but for most platforms I'm aware of, you'd need some extra non-trivial hardware, so here we'll have to compromise a bit. And besides, then you'll still have the debugging problem, so let's use an emulator for this. Most retro platforms have several emulators available. For this in particular, we need an emulator that will expose some development options. I'm mostly looking for the option to load some data into memory and execute it from there, all from the command line if possible. The last thing I want to be doing is launching the emulator, putting in a virtual disk image, and then typing some command to run the game. That needs to be totally automated. If you don't see those options in your favorite emulator, dig a little deeper. Those aren't things that most people care about, and they're often there, but they're just not documented. Along the way, I learned that, for example, MAME supports that, and even my favorite Amstrad emulator, Retro Virtual Machine, has some of those options, but there was zero mention of them in the manual. I figured it out with the help from other developers and by typing help at the command line. As a bonus, a lot of emulators often have a good built-in debugging environment. That will let you set breakpoints, examine memory locations, step around the code, examine registers, and all the things that we wanted to do. And the more accurate the emulator, the more features like that it will have. You may even be able to see things like what raster line is currently being drawn, a copy of the last frame buffer, registers of non-CPU registers, and things like that. It's amazing how much easier development and debugging becomes with those tools. Unfortunately, an emulator isn't the real thing, so you'll need your machine around to test the game every so often. And as a matter of fact, unless your emulator of choice is perfect in every way, I recommend you get two emulators. One is your daily driver for launching the game right away and debugging. The other one should be the most accurate emulator you can find, even if it doesn't have those bells and whistles that we were just looking for. In my case, the second emulator is WinApe, which is generally much less pleasant to use, especially from a Mac, but it has better emulation than Retro Virtual Machine. So between the two, I'm pretty well covered. To run your game on the second emulator and to bring it over to the machine, chances are you need to do something to it other than just assemble it. The output of assembling the game is just a binary file, so to make it easier, you'll probably need to create some kind of virtual disk image or ROM cartridge format or something along those lines. Again, because we're talking of such tiny amounts of data, I do all those things with every single build. So my build script assembles the game and then generates a disk image. And even in the past, with the diagnostics ROM, I used that step to generate several other versions and ways of packaging that ROM, and it didn't slow things down at all. Now, running the latest build of the game on any platform is just a matter of copying the disk image and bringing it over there and running it. One quick thing that I wanted to touch on is that some emulators claim to offer everything I mentioned in one package. You can edit code, build it, run it, and debug it all in the emulator. 
that seems quite convenient and sometimes for a quick test of some code or pasting something just to see if it works is great. But I find that to be lacking for a full project. That editor is never going to be as good as the one you chose for development and you're probably going to be limited to the kind of things you can do when you build your code and what scripts you can run, for example, to create these images. So for any serious project, I definitely prefer using separate components instead of an all-in-one package. So far, we've been talking about code, but a game is more than code. There are graphics, music, tables, levels, and other design data. You may be tempted to add all of that data as separate files that get loaded after the game starts, but that's a very PC-centric approach, and it would be horribly slow in most 8-bit computers. Instead, a common approach is to add all those resources as binary files and combine them with the code itself into a single binary file. As a matter of fact, I recommend converting all of those assets into data that the assembler can handle. That is usually a label plus some necessary data itself. The advantage is that the assembler will take care of combining everything, and you can use that label to get the address of any resource from your code. Also, the binary format of the graphics should be very custom to the platform itself, not a PNG or a GIF. I recommend that you write some kind of separate script that processes your graphics and converts them into the exact format you'll use. For example, the Amstrad CPC has a really funky video memory format, which I'm planning on covering on a future video. So the script opens up the PNG and converts it pixel by pixel to that weird format. You may be able to find graphic conversions utilities for your platform out there, and you can always start with them, but I would actually recommend writing your own because the runtime format of your graphics can make a huge difference on the performance of the game and you may want to tweak it to fit your needs. For example, on the Amstrad CPC again, you have multiple pixels per byte, so it can be advantageous to have sprites duplicated in memory offset by a single pixel if you're willing to give up that extra memory for smoother movement. Or in my case, I realized that it's faster to draw a sprite in non-sequential row order, so I ended up changing my conversion script to export the sprite in the exact non-sequential order that I was doing, and that ended up being about 10% faster. So having full control of how you bring assets from creation all the way to the game itself can be very important. The last thing I want to touch on are the tools to create the content, specifically graphics and music. I know some developers use modern graphics tools like Photoshop or the GIMP, and have good results with them, so that's definitely an option. Just work at a small enough resolution and you should be mostly fine. But for me, that's not quite ideal. Since my target platform uses palletized colors, I want to work with a palette directly, not convert it at the end. Besides, a lot of sprites are going to be sharing that palette of colors, so it's important to make it consistent across all different assets. And again, you can work with palettes in modern graphics programs, but that is not the primary way they're intended to be used, so you're always going to be working a little bit against that. The thing that clenched it for me was the need to use non-square pixels. It turns out the Amstrad CPC Mode 0 graphics mode has rectangular pixels, 2x1. So if you're creating graphics for that mode, you need to jump through some hoops with something like Photoshop. You're either going to be doubling every pixel, which is a pain and quite error prone, and then reducing it to a single pixel when you process the graphic with the conversion script, or you work with a single pixel and you just don't see the graphics in the correct aspect ratio, which is also not great at all. Because of that, I did a bit of research and ended up choosing the program A Sprite. Apart from the annoying font, I found it to be the ideal graphics program for my needs. It has all the things you expect in a modern graphics editing program, like layers, transparency, and things like that, but it can handle palletized image really well, and you can even set the maximum number of entries in a palette. But the part that really convinced me is that it handles two by one aspect ratio pixels, which makes it ideal for Amstrad Mode Zero graphics. It's so good. Another quite interesting thing about this is that a sprite is open source, so you can download the source and build it yourself, which is not totally trivial since it has several library dependencies, or you can buy the pre-built version for 20 bucks. That's not too expensive and it can save you the trouble to build it yourself. I actually think that's a great model for open source programs. Sometimes it feels that's either paid or totally free, so I hope this model works out well for them. The idea with music is the same. Find the program that's intended to create music for your platform. Arcor Tracker 2 is the one that I've been using for a while and is fantastic. It lets you compose music given the limitations of the AY chip and you can export data that you can directly add to your program and play it back. I so wish I had this in the 80s. It would have been a life changer. And that about wraps it up. That setup has been working great for me, although I'm sure I'll find some ways to improve it as I continue using it. So I hope you enjoyed this unusual software-centric episode and I will see you next time.